hi everybody, you know who I am. Um, uh, we're going to talk now about a lot of the work that we've been doing around next generation repositories. But um, I wanted to start at a very high level because Ilkay was telling me that this is often too technical a discussion for everybody. And so what I'd like to do is really talk about why are we doing this and what is the context around that has been driven us to, to get involved in this, in this work. And I think it's really important. And um, I also like to apologize to the people who have heard my talk before because there's a few of you I know in the audience. Uh, Martha Whitehead was saying um, she, she was re-listening to one of my talks when she arrived here, but she had so much jet lag she fell asleep. So hopefully uh, you won't fall asleep now while I'm talking. <laughs> um, so the title of my talk is Open is Not Enough. And I think I'd like today to look at the scholarly communication system through the lens of sustainability, equality, and innovation. I think those are very important things and we've spent the last 20 years trying to promote open access but I think we now need to start thinking about how to create a system that goes beyond just open that is equal and sustainable and also innovative. So uh, very briefly for those of you who don't know who CORE is, we are an international organization um, we were launched in 2009 and have grown a small, a little, little by little, but steadily over the years. And we now have um, over 120 members and partners from 35 countries on all continents. And really, our our aim is really to try to connect repositories around the world and and act as a global voice for repositories. So the reason why I have this picture up, it's, it's our Prime Minister of Canada, and he's, he's at one of the rooftop farms that we have um, that are starting to appear in Montreal because we can't have farming for most of the year because it's too cold. And so a, a, a new innovation that we've started to see appear in, in Montreal is building farms on top of rooftops where they, they don't even have to heat. The, 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 the greenhouses because they're just using the heat that's coming off the buildings. So it's a, it's a good example for me of sustainability and innovation. Okay, great. There's core, and I won't repeat that. Um, so just starting with sustainability, um, there's a lot of talk internationally about the UN Sustainable Development Goals and how we can move together as a, as a global community towards supporting those goals. And I think underlying each one of those goals is really access to information and access to content. And um, that's very, very important and access to the results of research. But I think we also need to think about how we create a system for sharing research results and knowledge that is also sustainable. Um, so is our system now sustainable? Well, Martha already mentioned um, our discussion yesterday and all of you who work in the library field at least are very acutely aware of the ridiculous costs of scholarly journals. Um, Here's, these are the kind of the list prices, so they can go up to $4,000 a title if you buy them title by title, but of course most libraries don't buy articles title by title. We buy them either through national consortia um, or uh, regional consortia or in some cases in the United States individually, but we buy big deals. And um, we are kind of stuck in this situation where we, we subscribe to a lot of journals, and every year there are more journals in those big deal packages, and every year the publishers say, well, you must pay us more because we've added more journal titles, even though we're not using most of the journals. And this is um, the results of the research um, study that Martha referred to earlier that was originally done at a university in Montreal, and what they did was they asked their community, what, are your, what journal titles um, do you use? And they also looked at the usage statistics. And really, they found out that um, about six, they're subscribing to 50,000 journal titles. And they're, they're really, really important journal titles were about 6,000 of those. And so this was um, evidence that they used 
to actually get out of the big deal and cancel their, some of their, subscription, their big deal subscriptions. And of course, when they did that, um, they ended up buying a much smaller number of titles and paying still a, a lot more money. So uh, the publishers have a very um, strong leverage in terms of, of um, negotiating with us around the, the prices of journals. And so as we move to the open access environment, of course, there's a discussion about do we move towards article processing charges. And I'd just like to show you some of, this was a um, research that the JISC in the UK did, joint, the Joint Information Systems Committee, looking at the APCs that they're publishing, because of course they've gone quite strongly towards the um, APC model. But they're paying up to, to 3,000 pounds, which is 3,500 or maybe even 4,000 euros for some of their, for one article, to publish one article. So I, I don't also see that as a sustainable route forward for scholarly communication. By the way, they, they're going to have another, um, they're, they're analyzing their um, APC uh, costs and prices uh, for 2017, so there will be updated numbers around this very soon. So one of the things that CORE um, has been concerned about is that the, the countries that are moving towards article processing charging, charge models for articles or, and open access will tip the whole balance and um, that we will move from the current situation that we're in now to a, 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 a situation where we're paying, where, where everybody will have to pay APCs. And this is a real concern um, as an international organization because we know that our members, especially in the global south or developing countries, sometimes their library budget is like the same as one, paying one APC. So they will not be able to contribute in, in a, in a an environment like that. Um, and and um, it's already a very unequal environment in terms of participating in the international journal system. So this is a, a web of science. It's a, an analysis done by Juan Pablo Alperen, who's connected with the PKP project. And he, it's, it's unfortunately a, um, a little bit out of date, um, but he, he analyze the research output in terms of articles according to the web of science. And you can see there are kind of two balloons here in Europe and in uh, uh, North America. And I think China's becoming a balloon now and, and Brazil is growing. But uh, a lot of these countries still have, um, are very small in terms of their, their um, visibility in the web of science. And I, I think um, that's not a problem if we have local journals. Um, and those strong local journals can help support uh, the visibility and the produc scientific production in those countries. But I'd just like to talk about why that's not happening as much as it should be. Um, some of you from South America know, already know about Chagas disease. And uh, Chagas disease has been around for hundreds or maybe over 100 years in, in countries in South America, Brazil and Argentina. Um, but I, I thought it was interesting that the PLOS journal talks about 10 years of research in Chagas disease, even though there's been research for many, many years. And, and that's because it was only about 10 years ago that Chagas started to make its way up to, um, to North America and Europe. And then, and then it becomes of interest to the international publishers to publish research articles about it. Um, this is a slide from our meeting, our Asia OA meeting we had in Nepal. And I just um, circled to, this is the research output, an analysis of the research output of Nepalese researchers. And I just wanted to circle a couple of areas that are, um, that are very important in Nepal. So one of them is, is mountain sickness. And this is a very specific issue probably for Nepal that's not very relevant for, for many other countries. And some of the infectious diseases they have there which are unique to that country. And so the Nepal, Nepal, what we talked about at the Asia OA meeting is that it's very difficult for Nepalese researchers to publish in the international journals when they're publishing about issues 
um, that are relevant, very relevant to Nepal, but may not be relevant to um, the editorial boards of international journals. And I can give you, it's not just developing countries, I can give you an example of the Canadian situation. Um, one of our biggest issues and problems right now in Canada is the relationship we, we have with our Indigenous people. And we're having very important discussions now about how can re we can address those issues and resolve those issues. But that might not be of relevance to, again, like the, the editorial boards of international journals, but it's incredibly important for us. And so, um, Again, I, I don't think this is a problem if we have strong local journals that support our research output. But what's happening is that we researchers and governments and promotion and tenure committees around the world are pushing researchers to publish in the international journals as a proxy of quality. So on the one hand, we have these very important issues in our, in our own countries and in our own regions on the other hand, we're being incentivized um, to publish in international journals that may not recognize that those problems are important. Um, so Leslie Chan, who's a good colleague, a good open access colleague of mine and ours, um, talks about how open, uh, openness is, is, is not simply about gaining access to knowledge, but about the right to participate in the knowledge production process, driven by issues of local relevance. And he, he has just finished a research project where he's gone around to uh, the world, to many developing countries, to talk about how open access is working or is not working for um, researchers in, in various countries. Okay, so that's the sustainability and equality lens. And now I'd just like to briefly talk about the innovation lens. So innovation is about the application of better solutions. Um, so this is the first scholarly academic journal, Philosophical Transactions, and here it is today. And, and I guess I put the question to you is this very innovative? How innovative have we been in terms of disseminating the results of research? Well, it's a color copy now, <laughs> and it's digital. But essentially, the academic journal has not changed in the last 300 or 350 years. And of course, there are other problems that we hear cropping up in the scientific literature all the time about peer review, about um, the lack of incentive to publish negative results if your research doesn't come out with positive results, um, and so on. So uh, what i like to pose to you is that the reason why it, the system isn't equal, isn't sustainable, and isn't innovative is because the commercial publishers have captured us through um, the impact factor and journal assessment metrics. And they've done such a good job that we've incorporated those metrics into our evaluation systems. So um, this kind of sums it up, I think. This is a Nobel Prize winner who actually finally said to his lab, we're not pu publishing in the international journals anymore. You know, he said, the pressure to publish in luxury journals encourages researchers to cut corners and pursue trendy fields of science instead of doing more important work. So I'd like to give you an example of the perverse incentives around this. And this is one of the um, university ranking systems called the Shanghai ranking. And 40% um, of how they rank the university is based on research output 20% is whether you've published in either nature or science. Just 20% of the whole ranking of the university. And the other 20% is papers indexed in um, the science citation index or so social science citation index. So you can imagine if you're a university administrator and you want to move up the ranking system, you're going to really try to get as many papers published in those journals as possible. So again, like going back to this issue of local journals, um, Martha mentioned this earlier, that researchers, 
we have our local journals, but researchers are really incentivized to publish in the international journals. So th this is exactly the, the example that um, Martha mentioned. When I was in Havana at a conference, I was talking about this and two Chilean researchers came up to me and said, yeah, that's all very good, Kathleen. We want to publish in our local journals. We want to publish in Spanish so that our, our public can read our articles, but we only get six points towards promotion and tenure if we do that, and we'll get 10 points if we publish in an international journal. So, um, so I think there's a real issue of how these incentives are creating a very unsustainable system. And um, these incentives really are in place and controlled by the international publishers for a very good reason, because they're making a lot of money. So I don't know if any of you have read this article um, in The Guardian. It was published last year sometime, I've forgotten when. But I'll save you the time of reading it. Is the staggeringly profitable business of scientific publishing bad for science? Yes. <laughs> That's the conclusion. All of these things that I just talked about were very well articulated in that article. And um, I don't know if you saw this recently. Uh, Elsevier's, it was uh, Times Higher Education talking about Elsevier's profits, over 1 billion euros in 2017. That's not their revenue, that's their profit. It's, it's just crazy. Um, and then I think another really important point is that the publishers, so they have in the past been working in a very horizontal way, so they've been buying up small journals and getting bigger and bigger and having bigger and bigger and more journal, pack, journal titles to offer us through these packages. But they're also now moving kind of vertically. So we're seeing this kind of vertical integration of, um, of uh, the publishing industry as well. And this is really, makes me really nervous. Okay, so here's a little, um, a joke. So this is, you can read it and laugh if you want. Um, so this is uh, something that was done by um, Jerome Bossman and Bianca Kramer. And they basically, you can, if you go to the website here, they've looked at other, some of the other major publishers as well. But what they did was they sort of mapped the services um, across the research life cycle that are being bought up by the different um, large commercial publishers. And so you can see it's not only publication now, it's the assessment system, it's discovery, um, it's helping researchers learn how to write papers, and, um, and we can see uh, that they're, they're creeping into the whole life cycle of, 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 um, of, of research and scholarly communication. And one of the things that I'm sure all of you, and especially the people in Europe are aware of, is the PURE system, which is a research assessment system that has now been, has been bought by Elsevier several years ago. And so this is actually from Leslie Chan, our colleague who I, who I uh, mentioned before. His, uh, his graduate students, um, it's a bit of a messy diagram, so I won't go into it, but his, uh, we see this most of all by the Elsevier group. And, and his graduate students just mapped all of the services of, at Elsevier that have, um, that have been um, bought up by the organization. <clears throat> okay, so... I guess like on a scale of excellent to poor, I think we're at poor when it comes to scholarly communications. And I think that's why it's, it's these issues that have really motivated us at CORE to try to rethink how, uh, how a, a system should work. And what we are proposing is a system that's distributed um, based on our institutions and libraries around the world. And um, I guess this is not a new idea because Lorcan Dempsey of OCLC talked about it in 2012. Um, and he talked about the inside out library and how libra the role of libraries are changing. We're not bringing content in for our local community anymore. We are 
um, creating content at our institution and making that available to the rest of the world. And we, we would be very successful at doing this if we could network our libraries around the world. And, and this is also really very much what has been um, um, put forward or proposed in the Future of Libraries report um, that was published by MIT in 2017, and we heard about it from Greg last, last last year, but really it's talking about rethinking what is the role of libraries and uh, around managing locally produced content. But I think key to this vision is that we don't want to have these little silos of university libraries with their content. We need to have this vision is absolutely depends on a networked, um, networked world. And of course, underpinning all of that content is the repository. Repositories are the platforms and the systems that collect and provide access to content. And so we came to a point last a couple years ago at CORE where we said, yeah, you know, we, we believe in this vision. We want to leverage the repository network to try to move this vision forward, but our systems are kind of old. They don't, they're not webby, they're not working, they don't provide the functionality that we really need um, to really move this vision forward. And additionally, and I think equally important, is that what we're doing with our repositories now, since the focus has been on uh, post prints um, or article uh, uh, copies is that we're really only perpetuating the system. So if we're just collecting a copy of articles that are already published, how will we be able to change the system? So um, we decided in 2016 to get together a group um, called the Next Generation Repositories Working Group. And the group um, our recommendations, um, as mentioned by our previous speaker, Klaus, said, are very technological, but our vision is not technological. Our vision is very high level, um, I think. And so this is the group. Uh, we launched April 2016. And our vision really is to position repositories as the foundation for a distributed, globally networked infrastructure for scholarly communications, on top of which layers of value-added services will be deployed, thereby transforming the system, making it more research-centric, open to, and supportive of innovation, while also collectively managing, um, uh, managed by the scholarly community. So I think... Um, uh, the, the vision is very strong, it's very high level, and um, it was that vision and these principles that really guided the work that we did. So we had um, one, two, three, four, five, six principles. The last one I'm just going to talk about in a minute. Um, and, you know, they were inclusivity, public good, openness, sustainability, interoperability. Um, I'd like to briefly just talk about distribution of control because I think it's important and Eloy already mentioned it. Part of our vision is that the infrastructure and services that we build are not centralized uh, for two reasons. One is we want those services to reflect the needs of the local environment and the local discipline and that's very important. And the second reason is if it's a distributed system then we can't be bought out by the commercial publishers. Um, and then I'd like to briefly just talk about trust and privacy. So these were not part of our original principles, but I think um, they're very important and we, we, we are adding them to our, to, to our principles because it's something that's very important, especially the discussions around Facebook and, and user privacy, um, and also the, the, the discussions around making sure that the information um, in our repositories is trusted. So we don't want to be vulnerable to the argument of, of fake news or fake research. Okay, and so, um, I think there are two critical aspects to the vision. One is um, repositories, and um, very important is that we have repositories that are um, uh, displaying common behaviors and common functionalities. 
And the second is that we support the development of value-added services on top of those repositories. So if we can have repositories that have common behaviors, we can build global services on top, or regional or national. Um, this is a slide that was prepared by Peter Noth, who was on our, our working group. And it's just very concisely um, shows you what we uh, imagine, how we envision the next generation repositories. So as, as most of you know right now, uh, repositories, the, the, the way repositories connect is through their metadata. And that's how we're interoperable. And, and the, the metadata is harvested by aggregators and so on. And then we build services on top of that metadata. And there's, very, there's a lot of limitations in terms of the services you can build on metadata only. And so what we are proposing is to make sure that our repositories are open and that the services that we can build on top go beyond just the um, often um, incomplete and somewhat um, um, bad metadata that we often have in the repositories. Um, so um, the, the kind of services that we're proposing are um, peer review. And this would actually really transform the system if we could start to build peer review services on top of repositories collectively. Um, social networking and uh, common assessment systems. And we'll talk about more of those um, later in the presentation. So here are what I see as the key functionalities of the global network of repositories. They preserve and provide access to research outputs. They enable better discovery um, of content. Um, they'll support research assessment activities. Um, as well as peer review and standard usage metrics, and they um, will provide the foundation of a transparent social network. And I think absolutely critical, and I don't think we emphasize this enough, and it was interesting that we only mentioned research data once in our report. Absolutely critical is that we're, we're not talking about research articles, we're talking about repositories that can support all the valuable um, research outputs. Um, that are created. And, and, and this is important because we want to move beyond the journal article as um, a, 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 the item for recognition for your research contribution. So we need to support uh, research data in particular, but also in the future other types of, of um, other types of research outputs. And I'm not proposing that we need to use the same system to do all of this. I'm just saying this is our vision for next generation repositories. So we published our report in November 2017. Um, and the report, again, is, is quite a technical report. It outlines 11 behaviors. And I'm not going to name off all the behaviors and um, 19 technologies. Well, they're actually technology standards and protocols. They're not just technologies. And I didn't get your new slide in, did I? <laughs> so, um, um, so I, I just to finish off my part of the presentation, um, the, the technologies and protocols and standards we've identified here are really um, generic ones. So we didn't want to focus on a specific type of repository that was only supporting a specific type of content. We wanted to identify the technologies that could be adopted by every type of repository so that it, it's, it's content agnostic in a sense. And... Um, we also recognize that some of the technologies are more well-developed than others. So there are some technologies that, have, uh, that will really support the behaviors that we've identified. And in some cases, we have behaviors that, haven't, that we don't really have well-developed technologies for yet. Um, so just briefly, I thought I'd mention what CORE is doing now because we published the report in um, November 2017 and I think we have real three real um, strategic areas that we're working on. One is to get those 
um, recommendations implemented into the repository software platforms uh, with a special emphasis on the open source platforms. The second is to really support the development of value-added services, so those network services that are built on top of the repositories, we really want to encourage and foster the development and um, increase functionality of those um, value-added services. And the third is that we, we recognize that technologies are changing all the time, and that this has been a really important contribution to the repository community, that it was an agnostic group that could recommend technologies. So we would like to continue to monitor technologies as they evolve. So we don't wait another 15 years for another report, but we, we monitor the technologies and make recommendations when new technologies um, are developed. So just briefly to go through these, a couple of these, and I'm kind of going backwards because I'll end with Andrea who's gonna talk about software platforms. But, um, uh, so I, I mentioned working with the, the, the current um, value-added services or aggregators to try to help with um, increasing functionality there and also making sure that we have, if we have regional harvesters and aggregators and value-added services that they're interoperable. And so we, this is the meeting that Eloy reported about and that was really our, uh, we've, our first step to try to make sure that we have ongoing communication and support the development of those value-added services. Um, and this is our small group that will continue to monitor the technologies. So it's just a subset of the larger group that we had earlier and, and we may refresh it with new people um, in the coming year. And um, in terms of what's happening with the specific platforms, there has just been a lot of uh, tremendous support by the, the open source platforms around our recommendations and adopting um, uh, the recommendations. And so, um, again, Andrea and, and Kazu are going to talk about some of the specific implementations, but I'd just like to show you that um, uh, we've already been engaging with most of the open source platforms about how they can implement the technologies and we will be working, uh, we'll have a meeting with, um, with all of those platform providers at the open repositories in June to discuss, to kind of share information about what the challenges are for implementation. <laughs> 